What's up, everybody, and welcome back to a special episode. As promised, here is the story from Jim Parent and his experience with the Mesa Police Department. Now, this video is pretty long. I did edit it down a little bit to manage the time, but I didn't do it enough to distort the context or the original message from Jim Parent. So be sure to pay attention and follow along. Um, I have a big background. I was raised in a police home. Uh, my stepdad was a guy that, uh, that I revere very much. I love the man. Um, he's passed. Um, back in the 70s, he started a, uh, uh, a motorcycle club for his friends. They all used to go out riding on their bikes. He started a law enforcement motorcycle club, called it the Blue Knights. And so even as I was a kid, I've been going to you know, like police picnics, police functions, Blue Knights functions, Blue Knights conventions and trips. So I've always been around police officers, and uh, I'm the guy that always says, you know, give them a break. These guys have like the, one of the worst jobs in the world. They got to deal with the worst people in society. So I have a great deal of respect for police and a great deal of uh, reverence for them. What happened was I was working and uh, I picked up a ride. I was driving for Lyft that day, I think. And uh, I was dropping him off on, uh, I want to say it's Hampton Avenue. It was a uh, uh, dispensary there. And uh, the last stoplight we got, I stopped at before I dropped him off and did that thing where, you know, you get a little tired and your eyes will dip. Um, so that happened. And I knew I was getting tired. It's been a long day. So after I dropped him off at the door, um, I went immediately around, uh, well, not even 30 seconds, around the back of the building and found some bunch of open parking spaces. So I pulled in and uh, did what I commonly do from one end of this country to the other when I've been driving it. So I get tired, I immediately pull over. Um, driving tired is worse than driving drunk, they say these days. So I do it, and I do it quickly, um, as quick as I can. So, because it's the responsible thing to do. Um, it's what you're supposed to do when you get tired. So I pulled over and uh, found a spot under a carport. And uh, I, I'm from Maine, I'm not from here. So I know in October, the end of October, probably a lot of people around here are thinking it's cooler, but for me it was still pretty hot. So I uh, pulled over, rolled up the windows, locked the doors, turned the air conditioning on a little bit, and put my seat back to take a little nap. I do it all the time. Take a little nap, maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour or so, if that. But usually just a quick nap, and then you wake up, you feel better, get back on the road again. So that's what I was doing. I was sitting there taking a nap. Um, front window of my, the windshield of the car had a light on it, said lift, and it was pretty obvious anyone walking up that I was a uh, rideshare driver. So I'm taking a nap, I'm asleep. Uh, next thing you know, I hear this, you know, this knock on the, my window. I kind of startled, I woke up, and I looked, and there was a police officer at my window. And then I just kind of looked and I saw out of my peripheral vision another police officer on this side of the car. And I was you know, kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? Um, that's what happens when you get woke up from a sound sleep. And uh, so I reached down, I picked my seat back up. So I was sitting up straight, rolled down the window and started talking to who I later found out to be Officer Jaworski of uh, Mesa PD. He started asking me the typical questions, you know, hey, what are you doing here, you know, and I told him, so I said, that, you know, I'd been driving, I started to get tired, so I pulled over immediately to take a nap, that's it. And he goes, you know, you haven't been drinking, anything like that, and, uh, and uh, no drugs, I said, no, I, said, I don't do drugs, I'm not drinking. Um, and, you know, they're looking in the car, and, uh, I mean, there's no... There's no like beer bottles, there's no booze bottles in there, there's no uh, like pill bottles, there's no um, uh, what else, like smoke, like, like a pot pipe, there's no smoking paraphernalia, there's nothing in this car, okay? There's nothing in the car visually to see because there's nothing in there, period. Um, and of course, there's no smells, there's no alcohol, none of my breath. I'm talking to them, I'm looking at them, and um, I said, there's no smell of pot, I mean, there's no nothing. I don't smoke, period. Um, so the conversation continues, and then he just, he asked me, he goes, hey, he goes uh, would you mind stepping out of the car? And I was like, what for? And he was like, well, we just want to talk to you, or something like that. When I get the uh, body cam footage, it'll be clearer of exactly what was said. I'm kind of paraphrasing from memory, but just the basic thing was, is he asked me to get out of the car. Um, 
as I remember, because someone asked me about this specifically, um, I, I remember opening up the car door and then Officer Jaworski was standing right outside my door and I believe he grabbed like the, uh, the top corner of the door and kind of held it open for me as I was getting out. And then I think he said, he may have said something like step over here or indicated to step to the side. And he left the door open. Now, I'm pretty positive it was him that left my door open. Um, could it have been me? Possibly, but I don't think so. And we'll know better when we get the body cam footage. Um, that's important because uh, one of the people that I'm close with, um, I have family members that I'm very close with that are they're local police officers, um, uh, U.S. Marshals, um, Another, some of my other friends are police officers, U.S. Marshals, and private investigator. So I talked with these fellows about this, and they said that was important. And they said, because if you'd left the door open, then they were free to go in and look around in the car, or at least poke their heads in. They said, but if the officer left the door open, um, they said that could be an issue. So I step out of the car, Officer Jaworski comes up, and he says to me that he wants to do a, uh, the pen test where he waves the pen back and forth um, in front of your face and you got to follow it. So I said, okay, we start doing that. And uh, cause that seemed pretty simple. I was just standing there while he's moving the pen back and forth. And as I'm doing that, he's holding it over here and he do this and he try to like hold it this way. And I'm, so I'm looking off to the side this way. My car is over here to my left. And all of a sudden I noticed that when he's got me looking over this way, the other two officers there were there, because there was three there. There was Jaworski, there was a female officer, and there was a plain closed officer. And uh, as he's got me looking to the right, I noticed the other two go right to my car door. And they're, they're bent over and they're looking in the car. And so I'm seeing this out of my peripheral vision. And I stopped, I, I, I turned, I go, what are they doing in my car? And, uh, and he goes, oh, no, no, they're, they're not doing anything. They're not touching anything, they're just looking. And I said, because I don't want them searching my car. Said something to that effect. He goes, no, oh, no, no. And he said, they're just looking. They're just looking. And I later found out that, that that was because the door was left open. That's why someone asked me if I had done it or if they had done it. Um, so he gives me this this pen test. We continue on, and um, I think he I think he stops and goes over and talks to the female officer at this point, and then the plain clothes officer came out and talked to me. I believe he's just asking the same type of questions, what's going on, what are you doing here, to try to confirm that I'm saying the same thing that I said to Officer Jaworski. And I'm talking to them the same way I'm talking to you right now. The same way that we've interacted this whole time. Um, because I told them, I said, am I doing something that I'm like not aware of that makes you think I'm, on, I'm drunk or I'm on drugs? So, I mean, pupils aren't dilated, nothing. There's no indicator of anything. Uh, so Jaworski goes over it, and I think he's talking with the female officer. Then he comes back, and he tells me that he wants to give me another test. And he said, this test, he goes, for this one, you have to stand straight, hands at your side. He goes, I want to have you tip your head back as far as you can tip it, and count to 30 in your head, and then when you're done, bring your head forward and say, done, or, or whatever it was. And... As soon as he told me that, that was the point when I, I know that if I stand and put my head back, because if I look up at stuff, I'll get a pain in my back. I've got a really bad back. I've had, uh, it's been that way for, geez, at least 25 years or more. Um, I've got uh, severe damage to the three bottom discs in my back, uh, and I have acute arthritic facet joints to injuries I've had over the years. Um, so I know that whenever I tip my head back, it's, it gives me a sharp pain. So I told him this. I told him I had injuries at this point that would prevent me from doing that easily or comfortably, or that it's going to be a problem. And he said, well, just, I think he said something like, just do your best, do your best. So I did it anyway. And I tipped my head back and I started doing it. And I knew as soon as I did, it was going to cause me a little pain. Um, but I did it. And, um, I know I winced from pain at least once or twice that I remember doing it. Again, body cam footage will be helpful. Um, and I got done. And he says, okay. And he goes, wait here a minute. And he goes back over and talks to the female officer again. And um, this time, if I remember correctly, she comes back, not Officer Jaworski. The female officer comes back. And um, where we were, um, my car was parked in a parking space under a carport. And right at the front of my car, there was a beam for that carport, and I was pulled up to that. I'm pretty positive. Then there was a police car over here, 
there was another one that was right up. It looked like it was touching the bumper of my car. I couldn't have gone anywhere. And then there was another one over here, which was our Officer Jaworski. So I had all three of those cruisers there. And we were on a pretty flat area. But so we're standing here on the left side of the car. Uh, yeah, on the driver's side of the car. And so she says, well, let's come up here to the top of the hill. I have another test I want you to take, and we'll find a flat spot. Um, we are actually on a pretty flat spot. Where she went up to was not a flat spot. Um, and I asked, I think, at this point, uh, we get up there, and there was, she goes, okay, we'll use this as our straight line. Um, and again, it's incredible when you look at the video of what she was pointing at. She was pointing at a crack in the hot top that was as jagged as it could be and like midway through it there was a manhole cover and the crack went around and through that and up there she goes we're going to use this as a straight line now this crack and i can't exactly remember but the crack was either um it was this it was inverted or it was up you know it was, it was a crack so it wasn't like it was flat ground so when, when i was first standing there talking to her i stepped on it and the heel of my boot kind of wobbled in the crack and I'm sitting there thinking, and then she's like, you need to stand back with your head this way, your arms at your side, feet here. And I knew, like I told Jaworski, I'm not going to be able to do this. I'm not going to be able to do it effectively. So I reiterated it to her, I believe. And um, so they knew that I would made it clear to them that I had physical disabilities. I told them, I said, my back is bad. I've had major shoulder on both my uh, major shoulder uh, surgery on both my shoulders. And I said, in 2019, uh, I was involved in a shooting, and, uh, and part of that, I got shot in the head once, shot in the chest twice, and one tumbled down my forearm. And I told him, in the, in the process of doing that, I had to jump down a stairway and landed on my left side and kind of exacerbated a lot of my injuries. But, she, but they were like, they were still kind of pushing to, well, just try it, just try it. So you're saying you can't do it. And um, it was at that point that I had all three of them kind of standing in front of me. And I looked at him and I was like, because at this point I'm like, what's going on here? Um, they've all been, and let me say this, that every one of them was respectful. Nobody was rude. Everybody was, was very, um, you know, and I was completely compliant with them. I wasn't rude at all. And I was being completely compliant with these officers. I was doing everything they asked. And I was doing so politely. But when we got up this little hill, and I'm looking at this cracked, jagged line that she says, let's walk the straight, this is the straight line that I got to walk. And then the thing is all roughed and the ground is broken up. I'm going, I feel like I'm getting set up at this point. Okay, this is the point where, okay. I mean, I've been real compliant and I've been real cool with this. Right to this point, now I feel like there's something else going on. And I kept telling them, I was like, what are you guys seeing in me right now? that makes this making you do this. I go, I, I, you're making a mistake. I don't do drugs, I'm not drinking. There's nothing wrong with me. I was just taking a nap. And um, so this is the point where I looked at all three of them. I said, I'm looking all three of you right in the eyes right now. I said, I'm speaking to you clearly. Um, so I'm speaking to you clearly. What are we doing here? Why are we doing this? And that's when Officer Jaworski offered up that, um, he says, well, he says, I saw some things that are, that are you know, that, that make us need to continue. And that's when I asked him, I said, what did you see? And I'm pretty positive this was how this went. And again, the body cam footage will clear it up. But um, uh, basically he said, well, he said, when I was giving you the uh, eye test, he said, I noticed a little twitch in one of your eyes. I said, okay, twitch in my eye. And he says, I goes, that it? And, uh, and then he said, well, he goes, too, he goes, when I was giving you the other test, the counting test, he said, when you had your head tipped back and you were counting, he goes, I saw your body was kind of quaking a little bit and your eyes were twitching. And I was like, yeah, because I was in pain. I told you that was going to happen. And I said, those are the reasons why? And I said, look, that was at this point, I said, look, I, said, I just want to get done with this. I want to get back to my life and get moving. I said, if you got a breathalyzer, I'll blow in it right now. So this was the point where I started offering it up to them because I just wanted to be done with this at this point. At this point, I'm thinking, this is crazy that I'm going through this. I was just taking a nap. I wasn't bothering anybody. I wasn't doing anything wrong. I wasn't breaking any law. And so that's when Officer Jaworski told me, he said, he goes, no, he goes, we're not going to bother with a breathalyzer test. And I said, why not? And he goes, because I don't believe the problem is alcohol. He goes, I believe the problem is drugs. And... I said, I, looked at him, I said, I don't do drugs, I said, you know, and, uh, and he goes, well, he goes, that's what, you know, I think is going on here. And I said, so what are you telling me? You need a blood test? 
I said, because if, if, if I can, if I give you a blood test, if we can get done with this, so I can get back to my life, get back to work, do what I got to do. And so he was like, okay, well, if you'll agree to a drug test. And it was at that point that um, he said, okay, he goes, well, let's go back down to you know, his unit or whatever, his car. And uh, so we walked back down the hill, back to his vehicle. And that's where he says, he goes, so you're going to have to ride with us, down, me down to the station. And we're walking by my car, which is still sitting there with the door open. And that's when I said to, because we're all in a group now, that's when I said, um, I said, you guys going to bring me back to my car? And I swear to God, I want this body cam footage. Because either Jaworski said yes, or the girl said yes, or the plainclothes guy said yes. And everybody was kind of, I, I, as I remember it, going, yeah, yeah, no, we'll, we'll bring you back to your car. When I asked him that, I asked him that for a reason. Because had they said, you know, no, we're going to tow your car, so forth, um, that's when I said, well, what am I under arrest? What's going on here? I'd have started asking different questions, and I would have stopped being as compliant as I had been. Um, there was just no way. Um, I'd have stopped. Because if you're going to do that to me anyway, then we're not going to do this. Um, so, but he didn't say that. They told me they'd bring me back to the car. That's another one of those things that's pretty key. Um, because I'd have answered differently. Things would have gone differently. But I was continuing to be compliant. He said, because I'm going to take you in my cruiser down to the, the station, he goes, uh, you have to go in handcuffs. It's policy. So I said, really? I go handcuffs? Because I'm like, I'm not a problem. I'm not being combative. I'm not you know, giving you any kind of a hard time here. Um, so he goes, yeah, it's policy. We've got to put you in handcuffs. Why aren't they just cuffing me in the front? I'm not a problem. There's no reason. I, they shouldn't cuff me in the first place. They really don't need to cuff, uh, cuff me from behind. Once they put me in cuffs, they start. he starts going through my pockets, taking my keys, taking my wallet, taking all the property out of my pockets. He gets a hold of my wallet, and he's standing there for a while trying to figure it out. And then he actually brings it over to me, and he goes, how do you get into this thing? You know, and this is just called the flip side. You simply push that tab, and the wallet opens up. He brings that over to me, so I have to tell him how to get into it, because I'm in handcuffs at this point. Um, so they take all my property, and um, one of the things that was just on my wallet there was a coin that my daughter gave me, and I told him, I said, that's really important to me, don't lose it. And they said, no, no, we'll keep all your stuff together, we won't lose anything. <laughs> that's important later. So then he goes and opens the back of the car to get me in a car. And there's about, if I had to guess right now, uh, from my memory, there's maybe about this much room between the, 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 the barrier, between the front seat and the back seat, and the seat itself. So when I tried to get into this vehicle, I literally had to go in backwards. If this is the door, I had to go in backwards like this. And then I had to try and turn my feet like this to get in there sideways. And I'm in, and I'm in cuffs the whole time like this trying to do it. And then he closes the door, and I'm in there like this, right as twisted as my body could be twisted. Okay, that's how I have to drive in this. And I asked him, they go, this is the biggest vehicle we have. And uh, from that point on, I'm in pain. I can't sit like that. There's just no way. I have to sit straight and keep my back straight. Um, so then he takes off. Every time he steps on the gas, every time he steps on the brake, every time he hits a pot, I mean like a dip in the road or whatever, I was in intense pain all the way to that station. And it got so bad that I had to take my fists and kind of that were handcuffed and push them into the seat and lift my body up like this so I could use my arms like shock absorbers. Uh, it was it was horrible. I can't believe that's how they transport people. We get there. He gets me out of the back, brings me into the station, and uh, takes the cuffs off. And uh, he makes a phone call to um, get the phlebotomist there to take the blood. And I had been asking him um, ever since this whole thing started if I could have a drink uh, because my throat was dry. I woke up, my throat was dry. And I'm diabetic, so my throat gets dry real quick, real easy. Thirst is a real problem, especially if your blood sugars are high, and mine are. Um, so, but they wouldn't give me one. They said, nope, nope, nope. I said, I've got a brand new bottle of water, you know, that I give to customers that I give a ride to. Can I open that? It's brand new. And they said, no, not right now. So they wouldn't let me have any water this whole time. Uh, here he gives me some water, and uh, we're waiting for the phlebotomist. Uh, to make a long story short, she shows up. She takes the blood. 
And afterwards, Jaworski tells me, he goes, okay, he goes, we take two tubes, ones that we're going to test, one we're going to save. And he goes over the procedures with me, and I'm just at this point, I'm like, yeah, 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 okay, whatever we got to do, let's just get this done. Okay, he goes, I'll take you back to your house now. And I was like, no, I said, no, I said, well, back to my car, you mean? He goes, no, we can't take you back to your car. I said, why not? He goes, well, we told your vehicle. Goes, you told my vehicle? But why would you tow my vehicle? I got no right to tow my vehicle. I didn't do anything wrong. And he goes, well, he goes, we had to tow your vehicle. It's just the way it is. It's what we had to do, blah, blah, blah. Again, the body cam will give us all this back and forth. And this is when I said, I said, I asked you. I asked you before we left if you were going to bring me back to the car. And you said yes. And Jaworski said, well, I never said yes. And I go, yeah, you did. I go, the three of you were standing there. And everybody's going, yeah, yeah, no problem. Yeah, we'll bring you back. Now, that's what I remember. The body cam footage will hopefully show that. Um, because had they, like I said, at that point, had they said no, my, what I said past that would have been totally different. I would not have gone along with it. So I know that they didn't say that. So he, I said, I said, you towed my car. I said, what, am I under arrest? And he goes, no. He goes, you're not under arrest. He goes, you're not being cited for anything. He said, just because we believe that you are under the influence of drugs, we have to tow your car. I was like, why didn't you tell me that at the time? And um, I don't remember what his answer was to that because I don't think there really was one. I think he was just kind of hemming and hawing. And at this point, and he says, he goes, don't worry, because you can get your car back tomorrow morning. And I said, look, I said, I got my, my backpack is in there, uh, my contact lens solution, my glasses. I said, I left my wallet, my keys, my, everything's in that car. I said, I got to have that stuff. And he goes, well, the towing company's closed. You can't get it till tomorrow morning. And I'm like, I got to have those things. And he goes, well, he goes, I actually have your keys and your wallet and your cell phone. And I said, I said, okay. I said, as long as I have that, I said, let's just go. So then I get, in the, get back in the car with him. This time he doesn't cuff me. Get there, and uh, he opens the door, lets me out. And uh, prior to that, he went to the back of his uh, vehicle, and took, he had two pieces of paper and a plastic evidence bag. And he hands me the papers, and he hands me the bag. And uh, he goes, here you go, here's your stuff. And, and I said, okay, thank you. Well, I didn't say that, I don't think I said thank you. I said, yeah, okay, and I grabbed the bag. And where we were parked in front of this gun shop, I mean, it was black, it was dark, there's no lights out there. So I just grabbed it, and uh, actually prior to that, he wanted to, um, he said, well, which entrance do you pull in to, to where I'm staying right now? And I said, right over here, pull in that parking lot. And it was to a gun shop. And uh, he goes, no, he's like, I'm bring you right into it, to where you're, uh, where you're staying. And I go, no. I said, I don't want all my neighbors to think I'm a criminal, because I'm not. And uh, so he hands me that. So that's why I said, I grabbed the bag in the dark, and then I walked back into where I'm staying and walked back into to my, uh, my unit. And uh, when I got there, I have a big street light. And the first thing I did was I set the bag and, and the paperwork down on my table. And I looked at the paperwork, and I looked at the bag. And there was my keys, and there was my phone. And there was no wallet. There was only my license in there. So I immediately, I need my wallet. And they took it. It was in their custody. And after they put me in handcuffs, they took all of my property and said, yep, yeah, no, we'll take it. We won't lose it. And uh, so I called Officer Jaworski. And I, so I left him a message and I told him. I said, this bag you handed me did not have my wallet in it. I need my wallet. So he eventually calls me back in a few minutes. I don't know how long. And uh he goes, he goes, well, he goes, I'll go out and check in my vehicle and see if I have it there. And uh, he goes, I'll call you back. Okay, waiting again. A little bit later, he calls me back. He says, I went through my whole vehicle. I can't find your wallet anywhere. He goes, I don't have it. And I said, I need my wallet. I need my wallet. I said, I need my backpack. I need my glasses. I've been wearing these contacts all day. It's part of the reason why my eyes are red. I got to get my contacts out. And, uh, and I said, no, that's in my bag. And he goes, well, he goes, they're, they're closed over there, so you can't get it till tomorrow morning. And I said, I need my wallet. If I'm going to pay to get my vehicle out of impound now, I have my wallet. I need my wallet, at the very least. And, uh, and he says, well, he goes, let me call the other officers that were there at the scene and see if they have it. He goes, I'll call you back. So now I'm waiting again. You know, and this happened at like 4.30 in the afternoon, I think, is when I interacted with them. Uh, it was somewhere right around that time frame. And uh, now we're at like 9 o'clock at night, I think. And he calls me back and he says, yeah, because talk to the other officer. She said there's a, 
she has a bag with all of your stuff in it that's in the trunk of the car. And he said, so you should be able to get it in the morning. And I, again, I told him, I said, I have to have that tonight. I said, you guys took it from me. It was in your custody. You took it from the time I had cuffs on. You are responsible for it. I said, I need my property back. I need it back now, not tomorrow, today. And uh, he goes, well, I can't guarantee anything, but I'll call the towing company and see if someone there can let you get into your vehicle. So he says, let me give them a call and I'll call you back. <laughs> I'm waiting again, third time. Calls me back eventually, says, yeah, I talked to the towing company. They said, they'll have a guy take you out back there if you can get down there. So I hop in my Jeep and I drove down Apache Trail to Apache Sands towing. Pulled in, that's where they had taken my car. So I'm waiting, I called, I called them when I got there at Apache Sands, told them I was there and they said a driver would be in to let me in. So eventually the driver shows up to let me in after I waited about 30 minutes or so. And uh, we go in. The driver goes up to the car. I kind of, I didn't touch anything. I let him do, you know, what he, what he was going to do. And uh, he opens the door. And he goes, well, the door opened. He goes, that's a good sign. And he goes, uh, and I said, I don't have the keys. And, uh, and he goes, oh, he goes, the keys should be in it. So he starts looking around. He can't find the keys. Uh, he jumps in and uh, hits the start button to start it. And he goes, okay, so, so the keys are here somewhere. Now we're here, and I gather my stuff up and I grab the bag that the police officer put my stuff in and once again no wallet um, so I'm, I'm getting kind of pissed now and because uh, I've had to go through all of this for absolutely no reason I did nothing at all wrong and uh, so I'm back on the phone again with Jaworski and I said I got the bag out of the back of the trunk I said the tow truck guy was right there with me we can't find the keys to the car but we know they're there somewhere we can't find them though um, I can't find my glasses, and I can't find my wallet. I said, it's still not there. It's not in the car. And he goes, geez, he goes, I don't know. You know he didn't know what to tell me. And I'm like, you had possession of my property. You're responsible for it. I was in handcuffs when you took it. That's when he goes, well, he goes, geez, I can go check my car one more time. He says, let me go check my vehicle one more time. I'll call you back. A little while passes. He calls me back. He goes, Mr. Parent, I found your wallet. It was down between my seat and my console. And I was like, that's how you take care of someone's property when you arrest them and you take it to tell me that you're going to take care of it. It's all going to stay together because, you know, and, and you're responsible for it. It's down between his seat and his console. He didn't find it the first time. Had he not agreed to go check again, who knows when and where my wallet and my money would have eventually been found. He goes, I found your wallet. I'll bring it over to you. And I said, okay. And... Uh, he goes, I'm here. I can't remember where he said he was. He goes, I'll meet you. Where do you want me to meet you? And I said, back at the gun shop. I'll meet you in the parking lot. So I'm there in my Jeep waiting for him. And uh, a little while passes. He comes up behind me, turns off all of his lights, gets out of his car and comes up to my window and starts talking to me. Um, the rest of that video I showed you, you have access to it so you can see what happened from that point on. And... Uh, and during this conversation, you know, he gave me the wallet. I started talking with him. I said, look, uh, all the time we've been interacting today, you still believe that there was something wrong with me, that I'm on some kind of a drug? And he goes, well, I'm not a doctor. He goes, I tried getting a drug specialist officer there. We couldn't get one. He said, but I'm not an officer. He goes, I'm not a doctor, rather. He said, but um, he goes, I have been an officer for 13 years, and in my experience, I believe that you're under the influence of a drug. He goes, I, I did it. He goes, I would do it again. And I'm like, you know, basically, okay, if that's what you think. He goes, he goes, look, he goes, you could be, you know, a really great guy or a good guy. And I go, yeah, I go, that's exactly who you've been dealing with tonight. And you ran me through the ringer, and I still don't know what for, because I didn't do anything wrong. And he goes, well, we can sort that out in court. But he told me, he goes, yeah, he goes, I believe that you are under the influence of a drug. If I asked him, you know, what the symptoms were other than an eye twitching or other than, you know, a little uh, body quaking, I said, what other outward, you know, signs are there? And uh, he wouldn't answer. He would find every way he could to not answer that. He says, it doesn't have to be any. No, you don't have to have any outward signs. Okay, so just an eye twitch and quaking, and, and that, that was it. And I told him, I said, look, I started boxing in 1977. I've been doing it a long time. One of the number one reasons that we can't get fighters cleared with their medicals to fight is because their eye will twitch. It's a common injury for anyone that gets hit. Uh, as you get older, people just naturally develop it with age. Um, so that was the best he could do. So we kind of left it at that. And he goes, okay. I said, when am I going to know what's going on? He goes, you'll get your toxicology report back. 
I think he said something like 100, it could be 120 days or 180 days or something like that. So I said, okay, and we left, and I drove off. And when I was telling some of my other friends who are police officers, marshals, private detectives, as soon as I get to that part where I said, and I drove off, they go, wait a minute, he just let you drive off? He goes, he just had you in the station, had you do a blood test, and he just let you drive off? He goes, he didn't stop you? And I'm like, no, I drove off. And that's when they were telling me, again, procedurally, they said that, you know, when you arrest somebody for that, and he goes, and he goes, oh, they asked, did he say you're under arrest? And I go, there was no time. He looked at me and he said, Mr. Parent, you're under arrest. Um, when he was putting me in the back of the car, um, he said, oh, and I'll also say, too, in, your, in, in the teaser that you let out, said that they made me take a blood test. Obviously, they didn't. Like I said, I offered it up to them. Um, but when he was putting me in the back of the car, he says, oh, yeah, because I got you in cuffs, because we're going down the station, I have to read you your rights. So when, right when he put me in the car, he read me the rights. Never said I was under arrest. He said, because I'm taking you in the cruiser and because we got you in handcuffs, I got to read you your rights. So, but never once did he say I was arrested. And, exact, and, and actually, he said the opposite at the police station when I asked him, am I under arrest? He goes, no, you're not under arrest. You're not cited for anything. So, so now we're at the point of he just let me drive off in a car. And uh, apparently an officer is supposed to also tell you that, you know, after a situation like that, that, you know, you have been arrested for suspicion of being under the influence of a drug. Therefore, do, do not drive for the next 24 hours. You need to go there somewhere, have someone drive you. You know, they're supposed to give you all of this information, which he gave none of. Um, again, body cam footage should uh, confirm everything I'm saying. Um, if I'm off on anything, well, I'm off on it. I'm going off my recollection, but I don't think I am. And uh, so that was that. I looked. I was only given two documents. Um, I was given the tow form, a yellow copy of the tow form, and I was given the form from the phlebotomist that came in and drew the blood that said, you know, what she drew. It was actually, I think it was from her, not from him, um, or something she has to fill out. So... That's all I had for paperwork. There was no, you know, case number, no nothing, uh, because I wasn't under arrest, according to Officer Jaworski. Uh, so I go down to get my car back the next day, the way Officer Jaworski repeatedly told me I could have it the next day. And I don't have the form with me, but I'll get you a copy of it. On that yellow tow form, I went down to the towing company, and I said, I need to get my car out of impound. I'd already lost last night's work. Now I'm losing work this Friday morning. And I hand her my copy of the form, and she looks at it, types it in, and she goes, yeah, you can't have that car. I said, why not? She said, well, there's a 30-day hold on it. I was like, what? A 30-day hold on my car? She goes, yeah. And I go, and she slides the paperwork back to me. She goes, so there's nothing you can do. You can't take the car. And so I grab the paperwork, and I look at it, and at the very top of it, it says, like, standard, and it said 30-day, and then it said something else past. I can't remember what the other thing was. But you could see where someone had checked the 30-day box, then scribbled it out, and then checked the standard tow box and circled it. And so I said, well, no. I showed her. I said, see where they checked it and they scratched it off and they circled you know, standard so I can have it today? And she goes, yeah, not on my form. So I go, what can I do? And she goes, well, you can call Mesa PD. They actually have a 30-day uh, a towing department if you have issues with that. So I called Mesa PD, talked with them there, and the woman I spoke to said, yep, we do have that department. She goes, I can give you their number. And, um, and I said, well, I said, can you connect me with them? And she said, um, she goes, uh, no, but I'll give you their number. I said, fine, I'll call them right now. And uh, this was a Friday afternoon. I'm trying to get the car back for the weekend. And, um, and she goes, well, you can't do that. And I said, why not? She goes, you have to call them Monday. They're, they're, they're closed until Monday. I'm trying to get my car back, like, right now so I can go to work. I'm losing money. And um, and I'm in incredible pain from everything that happened before. Um, it's just, it's a horrible day. And uh, I said, i got to have my car back. This is ridiculous. And, again, when I showed that form to my other friends in law enforcement, they said, whenever a change like that is made in a document, that's supposed to be, whoever did it is supposed to initial it and date it. And in some cases leave a description of why they made a change. None of that's on this paperwork. So 
I said, is there anything, I asked her, I said, is, uh, can you see this, this tow form on your end? And she goes, yep. She goes, I can see it here in the system. And our system only shows the 30 days as, as checked. Just the same way the tow company said all their form showed was just the 30 day checked. Not scribbled, not standard, checked and circled. So she goes, and I said, well, I need to, to get this taken care of. This is outrageous. And uh, she goes, well, she goes, all you can really do today, she goes, would you like to file a complaint with Officer Jaworski's superior officer? And I said, yes, I would. She goes, well, that's Sergeant Meacham. And I said, great, put me through to him. She goes, well, I can't because he's not on duty until the evening. Uh, but I can, you can put a voicemail through to him. He'll get back to you. And I said, so he doesn't come in until the evening. Goes, so there's no way I'm going to get my car back here before the weekend. And she goes, well, she goes, not unless you can get a hold of the officer and he's willing to correct it uh, before the towing company closes. So I left a message for Sergeant Meacham and Jaworski, Officer Jaworski, about this problem, about my car not being able, I mean, not being able to pick it up the next morning and it being on a 30-day hold. That stayed that way all weekend and into the next week. Nobody called me back. Nobody got back to me. Eventually, Sergeant Meacham finally called me, and he and I had a long talk. Um, I can go over that with you, but for time's sake, I recorded most all of that conversation as well. Um, but when we got to the point where I told him that uh, I'm, after I met with Officer Jaworski, I said, and I, I drove away from your officer. And I said, uh, after he just went through all of that and told me how he's not a doctor. So if he's not a doctor, then, you know, non-doctor Jaworski did you know that at this particular point, you know, a few hours later, that I was now completely over the drug that you thought I was on, that you had me tested for, and now I'm free to drive away? But you're not a doctor, you've said over and over again. So when I told Sergeant Meacham that Officer Jaworski let me drive off, there was this dead silence on the other end. And I didn't say a word. I waited to hear what he was going to say next. And then he said in a very somber tone, I have a copy of that video? I said, sure, of course you can. Um, I never did send it on to him because after I thought about it, um, I realized that he has Officer Jaworski's body cam, so he can view the same video only from reverse from his own officer. You know, we're not even supposed to answer questions, I've learned now from dealing with my friend Chris here. and said, don't answer mm -hmm. questions, period. I do not answer questions. And uh, the funny part is, is that uh, my very good friends and family in law enforcement that I spoke to about this before I even talked to, to you, um, they said the same thing. They said, do not answer questions. Um, the one person um, who was an officer in the U.S. Marshal is extremely close to me in my family chain. He's right up at the top. And he said, next time, he goes, he goes whatever they ask you to do, goes, just go ahead and do it, but do not answer questions, don't say anything, don't take a breathalyzer, don't take a blood test, don't do anything. He said, because every single thing that they're doing to you is they're trying to find a way that they can use something that you say or do to incriminate you. So I found out that the only way that I could get this car out was if my buddy was willing to give me power of attorney over his car, and he's back in Maine. As I'm telling him all of this, and he was like, that's it. He was going to stay in Maine for a couple extra weeks. He goes, no. He goes, I'll just end now. He goes, I'll come back. So he drove all the way from Maine back to Arizona so that he could go get the car out of impound. That's what we had to do. I was uh, a week or more, uh, more than a week, almost two, um, completely unable to earn a living. So I lost a huge amount of income. Not only that, all that time I had to pay for the towing for that car. I had to pay for the, the days that it was in there. Um, I think I told you that was like $496 or, or something like that, or $69 to get it out of impound. Um, this whole experience cost me a bunch of money, um, cost me um, an incredible amount of aggravation, and it cost me um, a, a lot of pain. It wasn't until January 1st that my back started to feel normal again after what I went through. And the biggest thing that it cost me was this. I would say to people that say that guys like Chris, when they go out and they watch what the police do, and they say, oh, you know, leave the police alone, let them do their job, you know, give them some space. I get that. I used to be one of those people that would say that and would defend that. But after what I just went through, what I just went through, no American citizen should ever have to go through what I just went through. I did absolutely nothing wrong. There was zero reason that that went as far as it did. So 
The thing that upsets me the most about this is my reverence for police because it's police like this that give all the good ones a bad name. This is why, and I told Officer Jaworski, and again, I said, this is why people don't trust you guys. This is why people get upset. And he said, yeah, I goes, I understand. He goes, I'm glad you didn't. And I said, yeah, but this is why. So for me, um, I see this, and the reason why I'm doing this is that um, this kind of thing can't happen. It just can't happen. Um, I did nothing wrong as a citizen. And for them to be able to do this and look at me right in the face and lie to me while they're doing it, um, and to detain me, to put me through everything that I went through, and, uh, and, and now I'm to the point, I'm not kidding you, this is for real. While I'm trying to do my job now, when I get tired now behind the wheel, I panic. Because it's like I can't keep driving, but I can't stop somewhere and close my eyes. Because there's no way in hell I want to risk going through something like this again. And there's no reason why any citizen should have to feel that way. Because I'm afraid I'm going to wake up to another officer, Jaworski, tapping on my window. And I'm going to go through months of hell again for doing absolutely nothing wrong. So people like Chris that are watching these guys to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do, um, if their job is to, you know, I know it's not to protect, but at least to serve, but they're the officials that are supposed to be telling you um, what is truthful, what is legal, and what is right. If you can't trust them to do that, which clearly you can't, I'm now proof of that, um, that's when people that just keep, just watch them and watch what they do. And if they do something wrong that they're not supposed to do, I think, it's, I think it's good that someone like Chris would say to tell the people going, hey, look, they can't do that to you, just so you know. Um, and I know that might sound like interfering, but the police should be 110% transparent. If what they're doing is right and what they're doing is legal, then they shouldn't care who's watching. As a matter of fact, I think that they should encourage people to watch because that just gives them more proof and evidence, more witnesses that they did the right thing. So for someone that knows me and knows my background and says, why would you be doing this right now? That's why. Because they've now taken my core, which was always very pro-police for obvious reasons. So many family, the people that meant the most to me were in that. And I know what those guys go through. But it's guys like this that make people like me get angry with the police. Because this is not what they're supposed to be doing. This is horrible. I hope no one ever has to go through what I went through. I've got a camera up here, and then this camera here has front and rear and interior cam. So I've got cameras that were pointing pretty much everywhere. And I'm telling you, if I get stopped again, I, I, I get it now. I just got to equip the Honda with all these cameras. So, and this was where, and then of course I had my phone here and that's the one recording I gave you of yeah. me and Officer Jaworski was right here. Okay. So, yeah, I had, <laughs> crazy man. This is what you gotta do, I guess, these days. All right.